differently tonight, as you can tell. I've tried to make myself prettier. <laughs> I rose you between are two your thorns. Prime. Epic fail. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have some friends with me tonight. Um, those of you guys that don't know, this is Randy, the Ancient of Days, <laughs> Strombeck, and this is Mish. I'm still wet behind the ears. <laughs> and this is Mark in his prime. <laughs> No, it's okay. <laughs> anyway, yeah, what we yeah, wanted to do tonight, we wanted to talk about the calling. And this kind of was precipitated by um, the guys in Ukraine when they were asking a lot of pretty specific questions and direct questions to us about calling to the point where uh, we thought we ought to do, we did an old man, young man we did. panel discussion on that in Ukraine. And it turned out really well. And I think it helped some guys while we were talking about it. So we thought we'd do it here tonight. And um, I told these guys before we started tonight that I thought the best way to maybe bring this across, I just felt like the Lord was talking to me about this today, was to talk about how each one of us three began walking in our calling. And what that, what that looked like before, what, that looked, what did it feel like with the Lord. Because the word calling, and we're going to see this here in a minute, uh, what the definition is specifically in the Greek, what that did, how we felt it, how we began to walk in it, and the cost that was involved, the risks that we had to take. And each one of us, I think, have very different stories. Um, I'm not sure if electricity was involved in Randy's story or not. Um, but <laughs> it wasn't quite invented yet. It wasn't invented quite yet. <laughs> he was consulting with Ben Franklin. <laughs> the day. That time. So, That's all right, I'll take it. there's two scriptures that uh, we, we, were, we talked from, or spoke from, in Ukraine, and let's, let's go ahead and talk about those right now. Um, which one do you want to start with? I, I want you to talk about where the word comes from. That kind of Second uh, Peter one ten. So I had done, you know, a lot of studying and on this, and I've taught just a lot. But I felt like we, we actually, Mark and myself and five of our young guys were up on the platform, and I just pulled my laptop out, and I looked up the definition. I'll give you the other verse also right now, too, is 2 Timothy 1.9. Well, that's the second time that I want to bring up that word calling. But I just opened up my laptop and I looked up the Greek definition of it and there was one and it was invitation. Mm -hmm. And I think so many times we really complicate this whole thing of calling because I think most of us, myself included, um, I actually can say now, you know, without sounding bad hopefully, that I'm, I'm actually walking in my calling now. But I know that will extend, and not, it's not just like a season, but that calling will grow, it'll evolve, it'll do a lot of different things, because every time I, I walk in something, the Lord will always put something else out in front of me. So it's not something that you achieve, it's really a lifestyle, and you actually can walk in your calling. I think most people are still struggling, what's my calling? Because they want to serve the Lord. They want to, they want to be with Him. They want to be obedient. They want to do all these things. And it's a legitimate thing to want to know what your calling is. Right? How many of you want to know what your calling is? How many of you are walking in your calling right now? Is anybody here, can, say, can you say that you're walking in your calling? We're right now. We're okay. I'm close. That's no, that's fine. It's it's not a, it's not bad if you're not, and it's yeah. not good if you are. Right. It's not it's not like I've arrived. That's not what I want to. That's not what I want to put it out to. But when you look at the scripture, I want to show I'm going to show you maybe just a couple things in this just to start with. So let's start in Second Peter one, 
10. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about you, about his calling and choosing you, for as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be abundantly supplied to you. We see some translations say like achieved or attained, but it's actually supplied my version in my head, not in here, says supplied through you, because I know the kingdom is in you, so it's actually supplied through you. It's the process of realization, of real, realizing that the kingdom is in you, so it can be supplied through you. It's already been given to you, so in the process of knowing what your calling is, or actually realizing what it is, it's not something that you take from outside, it's something that you take from inside. That's where your calling is. Again, a lot of us will think that my calling is, you know, somebody prays for me, somebody ordains me in the ministry, somebody does this, this is what I'm good at. All those things are wrong. Uh, and so this is the process of realizing through practice uh, what's inside of you. And when I said the word invitation, knowing who you are, and maybe I'm kind of jumping the gun on some of the things that we're talking about, but the way I see it literally is an invitation to be yourself. If that's how I can you know, say it in one sentence, your calling is the invitation from the Lord to realize who you are and be yourself and manifest who you are to everybody around you. That's how, you know, basically everything all in a, like one sentence, if I can say it in one sentence. Yeah, so on Sunday, we guys, if you, anyone that was here, we talked about how inside of every one of us is that original us. That one that we were formed and created in God's, by God's imagination, in God's imagination, inside our mother's womb. Before, can you guys just really quick, while we're in these two verses, also turn... Jeremiah 1 5. Because I just want you guys to see this is not just a New Testament idea. This is an Old Testament idea. This is a God idea. This is a man idea. How he made man to start. So when Randy is talking about how the calling actually comes from within us, the Holy Spirit comes upon a human being to bring forth all that was deposited in him at creation. When he was formed, when he was shaped. The whole point of the Holy Spirit is to release this original us, that spirit on the inside of us, to come forth and walk how we were always supposed to walk. Jeremiah verse, chapter 1, verse 5. I want to just tear this apart for a couple minutes, and then I want to tie it back into that word invitation. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. That's an amazing idea. Before we were, we were known. And that knowing is, that, that, that is a very intimate kind of knowing, not just, yeah, I got an idea about you, or I got a couple crazy thoughts. No, there's this intimacy that is tied back to Psalm 139, where David is talking about how, take, like, it's almost as if when he's talking about that, that inception of you, that creation of you, it's, it's like they took their time creating us, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. They intricately wove us together. They thoughtfully produced Aaron Brookins. And it was like, it's like almost every time he breaks the mold and starts new. That's the kind of thought process that goes into both Psalm 139 and Jeremiah 1. It's like every one of us is created so uniquely and that is the seed of calling. Okay? It's not just a, oh, let's just throw something on Randy today and then, oh, next year we'll throw something new on him. No. There's this constant revelation of who he's always been that comes forth. That's what life in the Spirit is all about. Life in the Spirit is an ongoing genesis, an ongoing metamorphosis of who we've always meant to be. So before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I consecrated you. Before we were ever in mom's womb, we weren't just known. We were consecrated. And the word consecrated means to be set apart for a very specific purpose. A holy purpose. 
a, a purpose unto God. The word holy means pure, means one eye. That's what the word means. It means to have one focus. We were created to not have a whole bunch of different things all going on at the same time. A bunch of eyes going different directions. The call of God is sure. It's focused. It's pure. And he sets us apart. And it's not just for Jeremiah. Everyone thinks, oh, Mark, quit teaching on this because it's just for Jeremiah. That's not true. If it would be so, we wouldn't see it anywhere else in Scripture. But we do see it. It's a pattern throughout Scripture. He calls all of us into this purpose. Third part is I have appointed you a prophet to the nation. So he doesn't just know us intimately. He doesn't just set us apart to be holy. He set us apart for a specific purpose. That word I looked up just really quick for you is the word appointed is, the, is a if you have King James or New King James, it might say ordained. Yeah, ordained. Yeah, ordained. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and that word ordained is kind of, I remember I was talking to you guys, some of you that were in the core meeting, I really felt like 2014 was a year that we were to ordain people at World Harvest. Not just consecrate them, not just know them, but to literally ordain them, which means to authorize you for ministry, authorize you to walk in the call of God on your lives. It's almost as if the trigger has been pulled. And this all happens to Jeremiah before he's even in the womb. The trigger's already pulled about it. Which means he knows he's, God knows Mish before he's in the womb. God sets Randy apart, and then he pulls the trigger. And into the womb they go. That's the appointed. All set up before we're ever even an embryo. That's powerful. And then this whole rest of this life that we live, from embryo to natural death, is all about the Holy Spirit and how much of that calling He can get out of us before we leave the earth. I even believe, and I'm about to go off the reservation here a little bit, that we still walk in our calling after we die. I believe there's still a part for us to play as part of the great cloud of witnesses. That's part of our calling. I don't have a whole lot of scripture to back that up. That, that is, is off the reservation. That is off the reservation. <laughs> but I still think there's part of that. How else do I think we, we join with Jesus and join with the people that are still left behind? I think there's all part of that. I think He's it's going to rule and reign. Absolutely. Us, right? We're going. That is still part of Which our means it's still part of our call. Absolutely. Because it's always tied to our identity. Yep. It's and that not, identity doesn't switch whether we're natural or physical or spiritual. That's right. The yeah. function will change, but the identity will never change. Whether you realize it or not, it's up to you. Your identity is still inside you. The Lord's already revealed it to you and given it to you. It's up to you to understand it and know it and then begin to walk in it. But your function will always change, you know, from different seasons, good seasons, bad seasons, betrayal seasons. You're still walking your calling. It doesn't make any difference. Yeah. But like Jeremiah, the, or, the ordination, like I didn't know you were talking about this ordination, but the ordination is already accomplished in the spirit realm through your identity. And then when you're ordained on earth, we're already, we're saying, that's right, we're recognizing who you are and what you're already doing. We're not saying, okay, now we're going to bless you, now go and do it. Exactly. That's what, like when Rick or Benny or anybody's ordained me, is like, you're already doing this. <coughs> and all I'm doing is saying, you just have more responsibility to watch my back now. Now I've been watching your back. You know, it's a lot more mutual now. We're like tied together. Absolutely. So, yeah. So I'm even thinking back when I was a kid, back before I was a Christian. Um, my mom would tell me stuff about me that I thought was strange. Like she would point out quality. I mean, I'm sure you guys have all had this experience. Or maybe if you haven't, um, it's something that you always desire, which is someone who's raising you up, <coughs> recognizing qualities in you, and already beginning to tell you what they see. It's one of the greatest things a parent can do for their child is to go ahead and even while they're still four, five, six years old, even younger, pray over them at night. My mom would just tell me things like, Mark, you're a writer. <laughs> I was five years old, six years old, and I remember my mom would give me this summer project. I'm like, I'm, I remember like 10, even 11 years old, she would still keep doing this to me, Randy. Uh, during the summer, I'd have off school. I'd think, okay, no schoolwork for Mark, I'm done. She would have this box. And inside this box were 12 or 14 slips of paper. And every week I was supposed to pull out one of these slips of paper and I was supposed to write a short story on whatever was on the piece of paper. Awesome. Well, I hated it at the time. I absolutely hated it at the time. But my mom saw something way back that Jeremiah was experiencing right here too. 
He even says this next. Do not say I am a youth. Verse 7. In, ver in Jeremiah 1. He's like, I'm telling my mom, Mom, I'm a kid. Can I just have some fun? Can I just? She goes, no, I know who you are. Mm -hmm. And she had me right. And what am I doing today? You guys know I write. It's not great, but it's, I'm writing. And I think it's pretty good. I think the Lord's revealing some of the stuff that's, that mom saw way back then. And that's just the beginning of my story. So, you want to say anything? Yeah, I think uh, one great way to also look at this is um, everything that's created has a purpose before it's created. For instance, like this building was first an idea in someone's mind. It was an architect had an idea before it was officially created for its use. So, uh, I think that's just a na natural representation of what's, what's kind of happening spiritually is um, before this table was created, before it was a physical manifestation, it was first a calling. It was first there's something that this, this needs to fulfill. Mm -hmm. So, every person that's that's, the, um, that's created, there's a purpose for every single person. God says, hey, I need you for such a time as this. I wasn't uh, born 100 years ago. I wasn't born at the time of Moses, thank God, because I don't know how I'd be without my iPhone, you know? <laughs> but like, there's, there's, there's a time, and, <laughs> and I believe, I'm personally convinced that we're living in the most exciting, the most exciting time in all of humanity. I, I really believe God saves the best for last. I, I know what it's like uh, running the anchor leg for a 4x4 four four team. You, you know, you say your best, your best for last. And I believe we're, we're, at a, we're at a place where God is literally bringing the most, uh, the people that he needs the most, the army, the end time army of people that are going are gonna to do something. And when we um, begin to understand the call that every single one of us have, every single person, we begin to understand and realize, man, there's something on the inside of me that God created me for this time because there's something about to blow up in this, in, in this, on this earth. And he needs to sink and use me. So I, 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 I got to get off, my, you know, what, whatever, whatever, whatever it is, you know, and, and realize, hey, listen, I'm called. I got a purpose. I was designed beforehand, and there's, there's a reason why I'm alive for this time and age. I wasn't born 100, 200, 300, 300 years ago, but there's something that God wants to use me now because my gifts 300 years ago would not, would not do what, what they can do now in this time and in this age. So... Oftentimes when we talk about calling, <clears throat> one of the first questions that usually pops up in our minds is, how do I know what's mine? Right? <clears throat> yeah, I, know, I remember asking that question too. <clears throat> and the answer, I mean, there isn't a pat answer for that. Okay. However, there are some specific clues along the way. And one of them was like what my mom did for me. Like not even realizing that she was training me to call forth my calling. Like, I think the Holy Spirit anointed my mom to bring that forth. Hmm. I mean, I actually got to the point where I was tired. Mom, if you ever watch this, I'm, I, I've told you this before. <laughs> I got tired of, tired of her telling me how great I was. I'm serious. I actually got embarrassed when she would tell other people how great of a boy or young man or whatever. I actually would get embarrassed about it. It's like, Mom, stop it. You're supposed to feel that way about me. And <laughs> the reality was she actually really believed it. Like 100%. She was convinced that Mark was going to be great. And she just kept speaking it over me. And so there's part of this upbringing that, that in your upbringing, in, even in your childhood, even in the younger years, there's hints along the way that I think we all ignore or we all overlook. And we all just think, oh, that's just that natural part of us. That's, that's another danger that I have seen in the gospel that's being preached in the church is that we've got to die to ourselves. Everything about this Christian walk is you got to die to yourself and then Christ will resurrect you and all this. And be careful how much you let die because some of it's what he put on you and in you from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. Jesus came to make us what? Alive. He died to make us alive. There is so much on the inside of us that needs to come alive that people or mom or dad or friends or even that might have pointed out along the way. That begins to start a path towards your calling. That's what David was saying. That's what Jeremiah was saying. So, and then the other how are um, specific things like the prophetic ministry. I, I think it's one of the most underutilized gifts in the church still to this day is the gift of prophecy. I mean, Paul said above all the gifts, I pray that every one of us would prophesy. All the other ones. I mean, there's some great ones. Miracles. Gosh, I would love to see miracles. How many people would love to see miracles? But Paul said, that's wonderful, but I appreciate you all would prophesy. And it's for this purpose. It's so that all of us would walk in our calling. All of us would see who we are in Christ. Back to Randy's point about identity. 
First see who you are, and then that identity just naturally does things. As soon as you recognize that that piece of equipment's a vacuum cleaner, mm -hmm. you know right away what you're going to do with it. If you don't, you're going to try all kinds of different things until you realize, oh, it sucks. Okay, <laughs> that's what it's supposed to do. It <laughs> until then, you know, you're trying to hammer nails with it, you're trying yeah. to cut wood with it, and meanwhile, you are destroying the piece of equipment. You hear that? Then someone finally tells you, it's a vacuum cleaner. It sucks. You're supposed to just run it back and forth over the floor. And if you think, really? Yeah. Just let roll it, it back off and let it suck. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it, all of a sudden, it does exactly what it was created to do, and you absolutely yeah, fall in love on. with the thing. That's, good. That's the same way with us. The prophetic ministry all of a sudden tells you, quit hammering nails. You're not a hammer. You're a... Sucker. <laughs> yeah. Do you get the point? Yeah. So, and then here, oftentimes, what the prophetic does is it will confirm the hints and the glimpses and the quick little dreams you had throughout your life. Like, I'll, I'll tell you this one. I, I'm going to pepper my story, and hopefully, at some point in time, we'll hear some of the other guys. But I, and I, I'm going to embarrass myself here. But I remember in my early teens, I would lay in bed. And I would put the headphones, because my stereo was right by my bed. And I put the head. these headphones are like, now they're cool. But when I was growing up, they, they were really big headphones. <laughs> Anybody? Yeah. They weren't Beats. I, I they weren't yeah. Beats. Yeah. They, were, yeah. they were Sanyo, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but I would put my headphones on, and you know, I would have Journey, or I would have Boston, or I have something like that. And I would picture myself as the lead singer. I would. And I would be singing so loud at 12 and 1 o'clock in the morning that my parents would come in and yell at me. And I would see them standing in the doorway. <laughs> and I had to take my headphones off and realize that they're yelling at me. For, and I didn't even know I was singing. I pictured myself as this lead singer of this rock band. And I was just like, I was Rick Springfield. <laughs> Anybody know hey, Rick Springfield? Hey, Jenny, girl. <laughs> so... I, and I just thought that, you know, I just thought everybody dreamed that way. Maybe you all do. I don't know. But I did. And then all of a sudden, one day, about, I think, it, I even remember the year. I think it was 1999 or 2000. I was leading worship in front of this, this building. And all of a sudden, I realized that the Lord showed me a picture of what I would one day be doing. While I'm singing the Boston, while I'm singing the Steve Perry and Journey, I realized the Lord was preparing my spirit, preparing my soul. To do, I mean, I don't, most of you don't know this. I used to lead worship here. We made a CD. I wouldn't want anybody here. <laughs> <laughs> but we made one. You might have to find that. I gotta find a copy. I know. I'm not. Not even nine, eight and a half. The eight and a half was the guy that <laughs> broke it. No one should listen to this. <laughs> so it was not that. It was actually pretty good. <clears throat> but it was a revelation, and I, I love how you said that. That calling is not just something you arrive at. As soon as you're walking in it, it progresses forward. There's always vision for the next step. There's always this, this next part. That's why I believe the heavenlies, if we pass on and when we pass on, is just a continuation of our calling and identity. Well, most people see calling as a function or an office mm -hmm. or a job rather than an identity. Yeah. Or so it stops. personality or a spirit inside you. That's your calling. Yeah. It's never a function because the function will always change. That's right. It's changed for my whole life. So if you see it, if you always see it as something you do, like even if you're a prophet, everybody should prophesy. Like when you when you read that scripture, uh, it's 1 Corinthians 14, 1. The very first word in there is pursue love, but spiritually desire gifts, and especially that you may prophesy. Okay, so if you have the foundation of love, Literally, all the gifts will take care of themselves after that. Because if your life is founded on love, that's the only way your true identity can come out. Sometimes love has to be pounded into you, or I should rather say pounded out of you. Not like it leaves, but when you go through hard times and love comes out rather than, you know, anger, first anger and all the other junk will come out, then love will come out. And then your 
identity will come out with it. That's why he says, pursue love first. Because if we're always trying to figure out what to do, what's my calling, what's my calling, what's my calling, we never can remember who we are. So if you focus more on your identity, if you focus more on the foundation of love, then everything else will naturally come out after that. Everything that you do becomes easy. That's kind of a sign to me that you know you're beginning to function in your calling. Not that it's like wonderful or stress-free or all the things that we think of easy. Because you can walk through hell. You can be going through terrible, terrible times and you're just at peace. And you're like, I have no idea why I'm so calm. It's because you're comfortable with who you are. Even though, you know, people are yelling at you, screaming at your cousin at you, you know, accusing you of all kinds of things. You're like, it's fine. Then you're beginning to walk in your identity because you're not worried about all the other stuff. Or, you know, when you say things, when you do things, when you even, you know, <coughs> look at Scripture, how you interpret Scripture is tied to your identity. Because we can get three different interpretations on the same verse and there's nothing wrong with that absolutely nothing wrong with that or 30 or 50 or however many people are here there's nothing wrong with that at all and when it's founded on the right thing which is your identity your your identity cannot be known or realized unless you know love truly fully you can't do it unless you know love and that's what we have tried to concentrate so much of our time and energy and effort on, is bringing the foundation of love and then letting everything come after that. Whatever the Lord wants to do after that is just mm -hmm. fine. And then the function that you begin to walk in, because I've been a Christian long enough, I'm 51, I've been a Christian my whole life, I've been spirit-filled for 41 years, so I have a little experience. I've seen hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people healed. And so the Lord would take me through long seasons of my life where he focused on, and I thought he was focusing on my gift, and it was really not true. But he was, like that second Peter was, he was causing me or forcing me to practice who I actually was. Like for one season of my life, it would be prophecy, and everything would be about prophecy. And I used to be so hard. I could walk into a room did it many times. We had schools and churches in South America and all over creation. I would walk in the room with all our pastors or a bunch of leaders and I would, you know, tell them their name. I would, you're sleeping with that person over there and you're cheating on your taxes and you're doing this. And I could name all that stuff, but it had no love in it whatsoever. It was all true, but it was just trash because there was no love in it. And they were crying, or they were mad, one of the two. <laughs> but, you know, I blew up more than I fixed, actually, because there was really no love in it. There was truth, but there was no love. And so it brought a lot more destruction. So the Lord was forcing me into realizing what the foundation of all the true gifts were. So if you look, if you look, I pulled the scripture. If you look in Ephesians, it's what everybody talks about. In Ephesians 4... 11, and he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the service to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Okay, then he talks about the results of of walking in the nature and the stature of the maturity and the fullness of Christ. Okay? But watch this, verse 15. But speaking truth in love. Okay, so when you look at your calling, most of us get stuck on, okay, you've got to pick one of the five. Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, right? right. Which one am I? Right now, right? Yeah. And that's how we teach the fivefold ministry. And we've taught the fivefold ministry forever. Most of it was incorrect. I taught it incorrectly for 20 years probably. <laughs> you know, in the last five or 10 years, I'm going back and, you know, fixing all my mess because some of that teaching was just stupid that I did. 
because that's not all of it. That's a small part of it. That's like what God chose to help equip the saints. Okay, but that's not a calling. That is an office, and we confuse that with a calling, that those are offices that the Lord established to help equip the body of Christ. Yep. Actually, it's offices to help every, everyone realize their calling and to walk in it. It's an awakening to our calling. That's the reason why those offices are there. Right. It's to create a culture where callings and identities are realized and then empowered to walk in it. Yeah, um, a couple things real quick. Um, one thing I wanted to say is, when uh, Mark and Randy kind of mentioned this, is about the whole thing about prophecy. Is, and I think sometimes uh, you think, oh, i got to prophesy, so i got to you know, get all spooky and stuff. But honestly, prophecy is so, so easy. It's encouraging. Like his mom was prophesying to him when she said, hey, here's what you got going on. Like she didn't, you, maybe she wouldn't put those words to it. But like just finding something good in someone, saying, hey, you're good at this. Hey, hey th th this is awesome what you do here. That's prophecy. You know, and, and I think I think it's so so important for us um, to you know to do that for others also, and just, is, is to bring them into that. It's like, hey, I see this in you, I see that. In you. To, to me, that's that's as prophetic ministry as, as it gets. You know, and one other thing is that what Randy mentioned about the identity thing. Um, a passage that came to my mind is is the story of Gideon. Um, I love this story because one of the questions about the calling is how do I figure out what it is? How do I how, how do I get there? What is you know, and Randy, Randy, Randy mentioned love. And another thing I want to mention is, um, is you know, people as a youth pastor, you know, many years ago, like, hey, how do I know what I want to do? How do I know, you know, where do I go? Where do I do? What do I do? How do I do it? You know, I had a roommate um, that literally was like, uh, you know, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna pray, and God's gonna open something to me. He sat and sat and prayed and prayed and sat and prayed and sat and prayed, and I think he's still sitting and praying years later. You know, <laughs> we'll wait for his calling. And uh, the thing I love about Gideon is, is uh, what Randy said is, is your identity is who you are. And the best way to figure out your calling is to be faithful with what you have. And Gideon, um, in the Old Testament, names were very, very important. And the name Gideon um, means, it's a, it's a heller or a fewer, but specifically what that means is to strike with repeated blows. And I, sh I just found this passage in, uh, in uh, Judges chapter 6, verse 11. It says, an angel of the Lord came and sat under a, uh, and sat under the, under the, tr the tree, this orpha, whatever, and um, he found Gideon throwing. It says in, uh, he found his uh, son, uh, his son Gideon threshing wheat um, in the wine press. And what's interesting here is Gideon's at this place where it's like he doesn't. I mean, his uh, the Israelites are being the Midianites are uh, overtaking the Israelites, and he's scared. He's at the bottom of the wine press. Um, his name means to you know to um, basically basically what he's doing is who he is. He doesn't even realize that he's living out his calling. But the thing is, because he was faithful with what God gave him, even though he's scared, even though he doesn't understand what's happening in his nation, you know, um, the, the bad people are taking over the good people, but what he's doing is he's faithful and he's committed to what he has. And he has that wheat, and he's in the bottom of the, bottom of the wine press, it says, and he's, and he's threshing wheat, threshing wheat. That's who he is. That's what his name is. And a lot of times I tell people, hey, who are you? What do you have? What can you do? You know, and if you're faithful, God's going to use you. You know, it's, it's the saying that, God doesn't um, call the qualified. He qualifies the call. You know, it's not about how good you are and what you're good at that all of a sudden, bam, I got this awesome calling. But um, he, he'll qualify you. If you're faithful, if you're committed, you know, as, as youth pastor, so many times, give me someone who's faithful 10 times over someone who's, a, who's an amazing singer, who's an amazing communicator, who's an amazing this or that, you know. It's, uh, but someone who's faithful and diligent with, with what they have, with what they're given, I think God looks at that and, and uh, begins to pull you out and bring you into your calling. And that's what released Gideon to set the, um, the Israelites free from the Midianites. And, and you, you guys know the story if, you, if you're uh, familiar with the Bible. But um, I mean, it's crazy how it all happened. But God found him faithful in who he in who he was. Is diligent in what God has given him in His hand. You know, do with what you have in your hand, and God will and God will raise you up to the to the next level. And so, one of the best things is don't sit there and pray for your calling. Do something. Mm -hmm. Live, do, do something, do something. And, and when you're faithful, God said, you're ready to go. Boom, let, let, let's get you doing what you're called to do. That's why he said in 2 Peter about through practice, you'll never stumble. Yeah, it's good. There's definitely action that's tied to your identity. It's not just sitting around, you know, praying and always, you know, asking the Lord what to do, what to do, what to do. I'm not afraid to do anything, really. Whatever I had in my hand, I did it. It's yeah. like working, ministering, yeah. you know. Anything. Moving chairs. Moving chairs. Cleaning yeah. up. Whatever. I don't care.
doesn't make any difference. I just do what I do. Totally. So, yeah. I was telling the story in Ukraine about David and how Psalm 78, right at the end of the chapter, says that, I'll, I'll just read it to you. You guys don't have to turn there. It says, God chose David, his servant, and took him from the sheepfolds, from the care of the ewes with suckling lambs he brought him, to shepherd Jacob, his people, and Israel, his inheritance. So let's listen, listen to this last verse, verse 72, Psalm 78. So he shepherded them according to the integrity of his heart and guided them with his skillful hand. So David was never trained to be a king. He was never trained to be a leader of an army. None of that training happened. That's why, you know, and I, I love Bible schools. I think they serve an incredible purpose. I think all these ministry schools out there are incredible, and I thank God for them. There's also a bunch of people that aren't going to them that are just out taking care of sheep. Out there, you know, they're probably thinking to themselves while they're trying to get the you. Uh, to, you know, the, the little suckling lamb to get off the you. And you're probably thinking to yourself while you're in the midst of this very mundane activity, talk about whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. You know, so you're sitting there doing this unbelievably mon monotonous, mundane thing. And you're probably thinking to yourself, this is ridiculous. There is no way that I could ever, God cannot find me here. <laughs> There's no way God could call me from this place of doing whatever it is I'm doing. And he's going to, He's going to suddenly put me forth into my calling or into my purpose. And there's David stuck. He is a bastard child. All the other sons are like big time dudes. They're Jesse's favorites. And Samuel comes knocking on the door. In fact, they, they knew Samuel was coming to anoint a king. You don't just show up and all of a sudden say, hey, bring all your sons. No. Jesse's house knew Samuel was coming. So these guys... And they knew that it wasn't going to be Jesse as king. Okay? So Jesse gets all of his sons ready and lines them up. And when Samuel shows up, he goes, okay. And he goes right down the line. You guys know this story. And each time he says, okay, Lord, is this him? And the Lord says, no. So he moves to the next one. Oh, this has to be him. No. And he moves down to all his sons until finally he's tired of hearing him saying no. He's out of sons. So he looks at Jesse and he says, is there anyone else? And I can almost imagine Jesse thinking, no. <laughs> nope. I mean, I don't know if we know the history of David, but it's not Jesse's. It's not Jesse's son. And so we've got this boy out there that Jesse's not even thinking about. And then Jesse finally goes, well, we've got this other guy. He's out there taking care of the sheep. And Samuel's like, get him in here. So here comes Jesse to Bethlehem to find a king they're all for sure that it's going to be one of these great big strapping boys. And it ends up being the guy who's, God will find you. In fact, I, I remember this phrase all the time. What you want, wants you more. Yeah, that's really good. Wow. What you are called to, wants you more than you want it. If you remember that there is a Father in Heaven, that there is a Holy Spirit sent on this planet to make sure that you run into what you're supposed to run into. That you lay hold of what you're supposed to. You have a lot of help. That's why he's called the helper. He's not called the leader. He's not called the king. He, Jesus specifically calls him the helper. Which means he comes alongside. Parakletos. He comes alongside and he makes sure that even when Mish goes off and does his own thing for a while and says, that's it, I'm off the reservation for two months. Guess who goes with him? And everything about Holy Spirit is to get Mish back. Even if he's out with the ewes. And in that place where he kills the lion and kills the bear and makes sure that all the sheep are safe, he has no idea that the Lord's actually training him, making him skillful to lead the people of Israel. He's powerful. We think we need to go to Bible school. We think we need to go to this and do this and do this. And all of a sudden, the Lord's like, you know what? I'm going to use construction to train up this guy to bring a nation to the Lord. Mm -hmm. Construction? Serious? Yeah. The Lord, because it says it's with the integrity of his heart that he led the people of Israel. How, did, how, did, how does that have anything to do with sheep? Well, he made sure not one of daddy's sheep was going to get lost. 
That's integrity. He didn't lay around and think, ah, Dad won't miss one or two sheep. I'm just going to hang out here. I'm going to be lazy. I'm going to learn how to play a harp. You know, whatever. Like, no, he was, and it says, and he guided them skillfully with his hand. He learned how to do all that with sheep. Randy, you're learning how to do that by selling cars with integrity. Not telling people the truth about their cars. You're going to walk in your calling through that. All of you, these simple little mundane things you're doing right now are training you, preparing you for the call of God. They're shaping your identity. They're bringing it forth. Some of the craziest, most awful circumstances in my life, I now look back and say, oh my gosh, I so needed what was going on in my life. At the time, <laughs> the whole, my whole prayer is, God, get me out of this. Whatever you do, could you please save me from this situation? Get me out of it. Send the check. Create a new opportunity. Do something. And I look back now and I'm like, he was shaping me. He was doing what he was doing for David. Right here. I didn't realize my calling was being shaped and formed. Right in this if you put yourself in David's shoes, can you imagine how much rejection he had? I mean, it, he knew... I mean, you know that he knew what was going on in the house with his dad, brothers, everybody. Somebody was going to be king, and he knew it wasn't going to be him. And he was just out there, just by himself, you know, like Mark said, the little bastard kid. And you know that's where we get plagued the most in our identity and our calling is right here, yeah. right? It's not in what we physically do in life because that, you know, comes, that goes, that changes, that does whatever. But inside is the biggest fight in your mind, in your heart, in your soul. When Samuel, if you go back to uh, 1 Samuel, the first four or five chapters is where Hannah, his mom, swore to the Lord, if you give me a son, because she was under complete rejection, I'll consecrate him and I'll give him to you. So when she did that, it served. It says that he served the house of Eli and the house of the Lord faithfully. And later in chapter, I think it's in chapter 4, he did not even know the voice of the Lord and the Lord's ways had not yet been revealed to him, is what it says. Samuel. And he was faithfully serving in the house of Eli in the temple every single day as a boy all the way up to his young man and did not know the Lord. You know what's crazy? Stay right there. That's why Hannah brought him there to learn the ways of the That's Lord. Exactly right. And Eli and the brothers were so off. It says that the word of the Lord was rare in those days. That's right. Because the priesthood was so defunct. Yeah, and so the reason he was raised up was... The Lord said, I'm going to raise somebody up after my own heart, after my own soul, my own desires. Not Eli, not the two wicked sons that were sleeping with everybody and taking the best of everything. I'm going to raise them up after my heart. So that goes, that ties right to his identity. It's Again, it's not his function. He was doing what he was doing anyway, but he had not even spoken to the Lord, did not know who the Lord was at all. And so even under all this wickedness, if you're doing all this stuff, even if you're so rejected and everything, the Lord comes to you and goes, no, this is who you are. He calls him by name. He had to call him four times for Samuel to actually recognize who he was. And then he has to go and then prophesy the demise of the high priest and his two sons. Like the guy that's actually teaching him. He prophesies, you're going to die all on the same day. And it actually all comes to pass. And the whole... The whole kingdom knows that he's the prophet. And he was just, you know, this dumb little kid. Yeah. Like, I mean, but he, you know he was under so much rejection because how would you feel if you're just slaving away that close to the anointing all the time and you had never known the voice of the Lord and did not know his ways? How many of us would keep going and just being faithful, 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 faithful? Because his mom, like your mom, like my mom, did the same thing to me. They put into us, and even if your physical mom and dad didn't do it, your spiritual one is and did. But you put that identity into you. They just, you know, helped us do things. And so his mom, when she consecrated him to the Lord, uh, said, this is what you're going to be. You're going to be a prophet in the house of the Lord. And so he served and served and served. So anyway, how much time do we have? Keep going. We're early. 
Oh, man. Oh, until midnight, right? <clears throat> Think until someone falls asleep. Joey. Have you guys got any questions before we go to the next scripture? <laughs> yeah, I'm curious. Guys, any questions? Rob? When you were talking about it, your calling, your identity constantly evolving, it seems like that goes hand in hand with what the scripture says about the government shall know no end, it shall always be increasing. It's like if you find yourself stuck in maybe one place without increasing for a long time, it's almost like, you know, you better check yourself because you should be moving up to make room for someone else to move up. So the more people we have moving up, the more the government increases, the more room that there is for everybody else to move up. And it just, you know, it spreads out. It seems right. like we sometimes get stuck. Well, not offended, but sometimes we get stuck thinking too small. Like if, if you're not really ready to move up, you're not really ready to be you. It seems like. Right. In that in that reference in Isaiah too, it also in that same sense it talks about the government of God and and authority. So it's not just the government, but it's the authority that goes along with it. It's everything that goes along with. The Prince of Peace, and it names all of the things of the Lord. Those are always all in, them. That's right. They're always keep them. That's right. Yep. Who is an increase through? Yep, that's you, me. He's not increasing in himself. He, he is. He can only increase, especially, you know, on this earth through us. Mm -hmm. If we literally take our authority, if we take our place, if we allow that to, you know, come through us. That's how it happens. It's, the more I, the more I realize, the more the Lord just won't do it without us. I understand He's sovereign and everything else, but you know, even if you look, this was a reference that the Lord gave. Metal have it right here in front of me, but it's in. Uh, oh well, I don't want to get off track. Well, yeah. I mean, otherwise, why, why would He extend the invitation if He could just do it all Himself? He can, but he, the whole reason why he created us was to do this in partnership, in covenant, in relationship. So it's an invitation to join him. That's really what this calling is. Calling is an invitation to join the Lord in what he wants to do in the earth. And I can't think of a better partner. That's awesome. Unlimited resources, people. This guy never runs out of money. You could screw up a hundred times, lose all of his investment, and he'll supply more. I can't say that about any business partner I've ever had. <laughs> At some point in time, it gets cut off. <laughs> this is a great partner, and he invites us to be a part of it. Knowing all of our weaknesses, knowing all of our stupidity, our frailties, he says, yeah, come with me. And he's got more wisdom. He knows what he's doing. He knows what he's doing. Any other questions or thoughts? We should. So when you're in um, a season of being stagnant and you aren't sure what to do, does he let you like bang your head into a brick wall for a while, or does he give you wisdom to get through that? Yes. I, you want to answer? Sure. Um, to, me, the, to me, the first story that came to my mind is the story of Joseph. I mean, he he got the dream, and this is who you are. Here's who you're going to be. And talk about stagnant. This guy, instead of increasing, he was decreasing. He went and sold his, by his brothers, you know, slavery, and then prison, and all these. It seems like things got worse and worse for him, you know. But at the same time, like, um, I, th I think there's something to be said about um, diligence and destiny. I think there's something about being, um, trusting God, you know, and, there, and, um, and him bringing you around, you know. I mean, that story, I mean, that story is just... <clears throat> It's crazy to me, the story, the story of Joseph, the stuff that he went through, and still, out of the bottom, God brought him back up, you know, and, you know, and brought him to the top. How and, easy would it have been, while he's where he is in prison, to bang sleep, his head. no, oh. to sleep his way out of it, right, when she offered herself to him. Yep. Mm -hmm. This is the easy way out. <sighs> Come on, okay? That. That's good. It would be very easy when you're just... Here's your door. Yeah, nasty, yeah. here's your door. Go ahead and walk through it. And you know the old way is we'll just take you right up. Mm -hmm. yeah. You can't do Climb it. Climb that ladder. Yeah. Right. So the part of that is if you don't know who you are, you sleep your way out of it. Yeah. Right? I mean, I just have to say yeah. it. Yeah. Like, oh, that's good. That's yeah. really How good. else can I say it? It's like, no, 
I'm not going to do that. It wasn't because he was disciplined in his flesh. He remembered what the Lord told him, even though he was arrogant in his, in his telling of the visions and everything else and unwise, he still knew who he was inside, even though he was in the prison. And so he didn't have to escape the prison through fleshly means. He did it through the Spirit. Yeah, I would say that that prison was stagnation. And God actually took him to the prison because there was a door there. So he tells Hosea, in the wilderness, in the valley of Achor, which is the valley of sorrow and suffering, there's a door of hope. So sometimes he takes us into these dark pits and prisons and these caves of Adullam, like David had. And there is the door of hope. Door of hope? What? There? In the prison? In the cave? In the valley of suffering? That's where the door of hope is? Yeah. Think about this. David, all right, it's a great story. They come find him out in the field and bring him in and anoint him. That's a great story. The problem is, do you guys know what the next 16 years is like for David? He's running for his life the entire time. Finally ends up in a cave of a duelum where, and guess who gathers to him? All the greats. No. <laughs> it says all the discontented, all the in debt, all the people that Saul's kingdom didn't want. That's who gathers to David and it says, you be our captain. <laughs> David's like, this is what I get to lead. Church person. Yeah. <laughs> this is my first church. <laughs> Some of our best friends. <laughs> <laughs> so you got 16 years where you know the anointing is on you. You are running around trying to not die. And you end up in a cave with a bunch of people that you would have not chosen. This is the call. It's worse than stagnation. That's not just the anointing. He already had the position. He did because the prophet anointed him. Oh, yeah. Yeah, this is not just your anointing. This yeah. is your position. And yeah. everybody Walking. knew it, including Saul. Saul knew it. Right. He would not let it go. Yeah. But he already had the position too. Yep. And he could have taken it many times. Again, he could have taken it easy way when, it, when even he had the opportunity he to kill He could have killed Saul. Exactly. Absolutely. Right. Several. Yep. But he always walked in his integrity. That's it. Back to the integrity of his heart. That's why he knew he could trust this one. So, you know, I don't think we can put a time limit on how long we're in that prison or how long we're in the cave or how long we take to walk through the wilderness until we finally hit the door of hope. I don't think we can put a time limit. But in that process, David's being trained some more. In that pit, in that prison, Joseph is being trained in who he is. Looking for the door. I think the same way with the wilderness and Hosea. Come on out here. Come on out here to the valley of sorrow. Oh, no, I don't want to go there. Can we do it on the mountain of transfiguration where it's beautiful? And let's just stay here forever. Let's build tabernacles. Let's hang out here. No, in the valley. That's where you're, that's where the calling becomes established. That's where you show up for it. Psalm 23. As I walk through the valley of the shadow, as I walk through it, not when I Hang out, camp out, mourn, and get crazy. Just walk through it. You're going you're gonna to get through it. Just keep walking. Yep. That's a really good question. Thanks for asking. Anybody else? Well, just in the thought process, you know, what you were saying earlier about um, the craftsmanship that went into our identity. Our identity. You know, and whatever you're referring to, the person, Jeremiah, I was thinking someone up reading earlier in the week with Ecclesiastes. Uh, verse 14, where it says, I know that I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it, nothing taken away from it. God does it so that the people will fear Him. Whatever is, oh, whatever is has already been, and what will be has been before, and God will call the past to account. And I just I think about that because, you know, in a sense of, you know, he, He's taken and crafted, you know, our integrity through all the bad stuff that we may view as bad or even good, you know, the good stuff that happens, you know, not to think, I was just reminded of this today with a phone conversation I had, but, you know, not to think badly on the bad stuff because God, God already knew all this stuff. He's using, you know, and it just, I don't know, it just reminded me, not to go back to where you were at before, no, it's good. but, you know, just uh, everything happens for, uh, in a season, for a time. 
and, 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 and but he already knew that. He already knows what we're going to go through. You know, it's you know, and that, I don't know. I just want to bring that up, yeah. just because you know what you what you referred to in Jeremiah. There, like it's just you know, really connected. Yeah, it's good. Thanks for sharing. That. Anybody else? I think it's kind of cool that uh, Joseph was called a dreamer. His brothers called him a dreamer. And he ends up in prison. And it really, you know, things really connect with him with dreams. So part of his, uh, you know, his calling really, you know, kind of was really activated there. So, uh, to the saving of the whole nation. And uh, so... You know, whether you're banging your head against the wall or in prison, or even people that are in opposition to you can still uh, be speaking into your. Uh, they, you know, they they jokingly made fun of him and called him a dreamer, but that's who he was. And I think in prison he was he was remembering those things and he was picturing. Uh, you know, he was dreaming. I <laughs> think he was dreaming and he was interpreting dreams. And wow. When you use what's in your hand, God will release what's in your heart. Well, and also, your, your calling and everything that's wrapped to it, your identity, will get you in trouble. It's supposed to get you in trouble. <laughs> that's awesome. It is. If you don't go through that valley, your calling's really small. <laughs> and you hear Rick say it all the time. It's directly tied to you know, your level of anointing based on how much trouble and betrayals and Crap beatings and everything you go through, right? Because of the significance of it, right? So if you, you know, you're, everything just comes easy, wonderful, yeah, man, life is great, everybody's healed, everybody's rich, everybody's out of debt, <laughs> wonderful, you know? It's just like, it means nothing because it's not tempered, you know, something like that. You, you walk through, you'll walk through a season like that, and I have too, where everything's awesome. But that's not life. You know, you're supposed to walk. You have to walk through those things. And your calling is supposed to get you in trouble. Yeah. So that you can learn for yourself yeah, that's good. if you sleep your way out. Or if you, mm -hmm. you know, wiggle your way out. Or if you look for the man doors. If you do yeah. all these things. That's supposed to temper who you are inside. It's mm -hmm. only, it would only be between him and that woman. And nobody else would have known. But he would. He would have got out. That's why the prosperity gospel is a real problem. Because it trains us to look for the easiest way. It trains us to look for the blessing way out. And to look for the, the gravy train, so to speak. And we think that once we're on the blessing train, then we're now we're where God wants us. Now God's finally blessing, finally pouring out all that He ever promised us. And so we never see pain and sorrow and heartbreak as opportunities. We instead see them as, oh, we're out of God's will. Mm -hmm. Something's wrong with us if we're hurting. Mm -hmm. Something's wrong with us if things aren't going well. Something's wrong. I mean, there's some aspects to that that are probably true. I was talking to Diane this week about this. You know, there's some suffering that you're going through that is completely you created. <laughs> and I'm not sure there's a whole lot of glory of the Lord that's going to come forth from that. There's just going to be some, hey, can, I'll help you fix it if you need to, but you're going to fix it. And you're probably going to have to walk through some junk to get it fixed. And then there's some real true suffering. And that part comes along with developing your calling and development, bringing forth your identity. I will tell you, there ain't no baby born without labor. <laughs> Purposefully. I, I believe that, that that labor that God put upon the woman, and I'm sorry ladies, but it's partly as a picture of what spiritual calling and identity looks like. Mm -hmm. You want to bring forth spiritual calling? You want to bring forth your identity? It's going to take some labor. Mm -hmm. You have to squeeze through a very small canal. Hey, I'm serious. This, think about this. It takes humility to walk in your calling. It takes a lot of pressure and a lot of squeezing to come out on the other side and breathe the air you're supposed to breathe. Man, it was nice and comfortable in Mama's womb. Oh, man. I didn't even have to open my eyes. I didn't have to cry. I got fed, I got fed all the time. I didn't have to put any clothes on. It was always warm. I was floating. The whole time, I am floating, baby. 
This is great. And then suddenly, I'm starting to feel shaking, and it's actually the baby that tells mom, I'm ready. Physically. The baby tells the mother, I'm done, I'm ready, let's go. The baby doesn't realize it's telling mom that. And then suddenly it starts getting pushed through this extremely small place, comes out, and is suddenly suffering. It immediately suffers because it's breathing something it has never, it's never breathed before. It doesn't even know it can breathe. It doesn't know it has lungs. It starts living in a completely different environment. It was doing way better in the womb than it's doing outside the womb. It was self-sufficient in the womb. Now suddenly it desperately needs someone taking care of itself. You guys with me? Put me back. Yeah. Someone squeeze me back through there. I'm willing to go through it one more time to get back in there. And then just to make sure it can't, what comes out right after the baby? You can't go back. Everything that once supplied you in the past season becomes waste in the next. Just put it out there, aren't you, Lauren? <laughs> Sometimes our decisions affect other people in their moment very negatively. Like I, I'll never forget in 2005 when I just decided that's it. I'm not working this full-time job anymore. I had some people that were working for me that really thought that is the wrong decision. What are you doing? But I knew I needed to lay hold of what God laid hold of me for. And it wasn't soon after that that it made my family suffer, financially and otherwise. <laughs> There was many times, Lauren, where I was thinking to myself, this isn't right. They shouldn't suffer like this. They, if, this is the, if this is the call of God on my life, then God will just open up the windows of heaven and He's going to pour out a blessing just like Scripture says and everything's going to go the way He said it would go. And it got worse before better. And I, st I, mean, I started looking at my wife who was just like, uh, Mark, are you sure? Mark, no, seriously, are you sure? And I'm like, I don't know anymore. I remember thinking to myself, I don't even know. And I'm the one that made the decision. Yeah, it's, it's going to cause other people pain. But I think it does, it begins to maybe instigate their own process mm -hmm. that they need to go through. That maybe they were either not able to do themselves or were just comfortable floating in the womb. And it takes someone with some cojones to say, that's it. <laughs> I'm going to do this. And yeah, it does put some other people in jeopardy or at risk or in pain. But I think you're absolutely right, Lauren. I think it can very much start the process for other people. Even involuntarily. I think sometimes we have to we have to be in the darkness and in the cave. Because when everything's great, you don't you're not looking for the hope. You're not looking for you're not looking for you're just not looking for it. You're not looking for hope because everything's great. But when it's dark and when you're in that cave, you're looking for it. You're, you're looking seeking. for it. You're going to find it because you're actually looking for it. When things are cushy, things are great. Yeah. Like, hey, I don't need to look for anything. Right. So, you know, there's a lot of times where you have to be in that that dark place. Yep. I remember when I, when I first started in business and I would run into a struggle or a situation. I remember going to certain business people because they were very successful in business. I remember, you know, if I'm going to ask someone's advice in business, I'm going to ask someone successful. Absolutely. Right? Makes a lot of sense. So I would go to them and I would say, okay, here's my struggle. Here's what we're going through right now. And they could not help me. They had, in fact, both times, I remember talking to two different very successful businessmen, and in both cases, they had no help for me. And after a while, I go home, and I, I'm like, I don't understand this. And then one of the guys came back to me and says, hey, Mark, I need to know, I need you to know, I just realized why I wasn't able to give you the advice you needed. I go, why? He says, because I've never been there. I've never struggled like that in business. I've always had success. They started their business at the right time, or it was the right, or whatever it been. They were never in the particular place I was in. 
So they didn't have any advice for me on how to get out of it or how to walk through it. And so um, I, I learned a valuable lesson there that, you know, in success, you're not looking to learn a lot. You're not looking to, I think that's a really great point you make, Matt, is that when everything's going well, there's not a whole lot you need to learn. Why? Because everything's going well. The only time you suddenly feel like you need to learn something is when things are not going well. Why do you, when do most people go back to school? <laughs> How many people go to school when they're making a million dollars a year? Oh, I think I better go back to school so I can get more skill. <laughs> they're making a million dollars a year. They don't need to. But when they suddenly lose their good job and they've got nothing on the horizon, you know what? I better get some skills. I better grow and develop. So you're absolutely right. I, I think it's in those places, in the valley of the shadow of death. Oh, I can't just rely on this or that. I, yeah, I need to seek. Um, going back to the womb thing, if, if we don't leave the womb, though, like naturally, the baby would die. It, it can't stay in there forever. So I think that, that sometimes there comes a point where we we have to realize that somebody has to push us one or the other, yeah. and we need to get out of it. That's good. The baby doesn't know that, though. Think about this. The baby has no idea that the womb's not good for it anymore. So the baby's wondering what in the H is going on here right now, that I'm being pushed out of a very comfortable place, I'm being literally ejected from, this is great. What did I do wrong? Sometimes yeah. how, many time, how many times have we, you know, done stuff like that and the first thing, uh, first question is what did I do wrong? Where did I go off track? I've had really close friends of mine when I'm going through real bad stuff, you know, ask me, well, have you, you know, have you had a chance to go back and, you know, figure out where you went wrong? That's the first question. Instead of, you know, asking the right questions. And the right question is, you obey the Lord. You know, we went through this process. I shared some of it one time when I was up here about you know the struggles we went through for years, and I had to go back and ask the Lord where I went wrong. Boy, they're really hungry, aren't they? <laughs> that is the longest ring. <laughs> <laughs> is it a workout? I think. Yeah, I think it is. Go, 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 go. That is the longest ring. It must be an alarm clock or something. That's all right. It's all right. It's cheap entertainment. <laughs> but I figured out it was about obedience. Because I never, in that process of basically losing everything, whined and complained or anything like that. My wife and I were together, even though we were in a mess, you know, financially and in many other ways. But we knew what the Lord told us to do, much like you. It made us question. And when I answered this guy, where did you go wrong? I went, well, I didn't go wrong. He's like, what are you talking about? I asked the Lord about this, and the Lord told me, did you do what I asked you to? Did you obey? And I went, yes, I did to the best of my ability. Because he's not looking for perfection. Yes, I did to the best of my ability. Then you were successful, even though you lost all this because you obeyed me. That's what the test of holiness is, actually, is knowing the Holy Spirit and obeying the Holy Spirit. If you can boil down holiness into something very short, that's holiness. It's not your actions. It's not anything else. It's knowing the voice of the Holy Spirit and obeying it to the best of your ability. That's what true holiness is, because you're reflecting the one that's inside. That's where the spirit is. It's basically your identity. It's tied to all the same thing. So we get all wrapped up with this stuff. You want you want to let's read this scripture. How about that? Which one? Second, second, second Timothy. Yeah. Second Timothy one nine. Let's start in 8, actually. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord for of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering 
for the gospel. Join with me in suffering. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to get right on that. Thanks a lot. <laughs> According to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with the holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus for all eternity. So you see, it's his purpose. Again, it's inside. It was already given to him. And it says that he has the grace for it. So, grace, I think, is greatly misunderstood. We just think it's like, we'll say we have the grace to endure this. But that's like sitting in the cheap seats to me. You know, grace actually empowers you not to sin. And so instead of the a perverted, oh, I can do whatever I want to. You know, when we talk about like grace versus hyper grace or legalism or lawlessness or whatever, grace empowers me not to sin. Not that I can get away with sin. It's the whole opposite. So it's the same with this. If I have grace, he talks about suffering. We would see this in the context if I have grace to endure through all of this, through his purposes, through the suffering, instead of grace actually propels me into that. That's why they could have joy when they suffered, because they truly knew what grace was. When Stephen, when he was dying, why do you think he was doing what he was doing? He had grace not to die because right in the middle of it, he could see the Lord. He literally could see the Lord, what he was doing. His purpose, that's what it says, his purpose in all these things. And he had the grace, literally, to see what his purpose was. Okay? It's not the enduring of the suffering. Sometimes suffering can be really, really hard. But if there's truly, like what you were saying, the suffering that's attached to the part of us that we're supposed to go through, not just the stupid stuff we do, right? There literally is grace because it's it's releasing these things out of us. And when I said earlier about the invitation in the definition I give or I gave, I think it also is an invitation to reveal who he is in us. That is the invitation. That is the calling. Okay, not just who we are, but who he literally is in us. Keep going down to that verse, or that chapter, I'm sorry. You go down to uh, verse 10. But now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus. That's where all of this starts, in the revelation. That's the word apocalypto again. That revelation of Jesus Christ. In that revelation is where we begin to see our holy calling. Who abolished death, brought life and immortality through the gospel. Verse 11. For which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher. Well, pick one, Paul. No, I'm all of them. At any point in time, I need to walk in any of these. And that's one of the things I think about calling that I think we have to be careful about. It's not as specific as we'd like it to be. Oftentimes, our calling is more general based upon the circumstance, the situation. The moment that we're in. I know we'd all like it to be, oh, nope, this is me. And this is what I'm called to do. I've got a cape. And on the back of my cape, it has a title. And I fly through the air with this thing. And I do this wherever I go. No. At one time when he's in Rome, he's a Roman. Roman. When he's with Jews, he's a... I mean, anywhere he goes, he'll be whatever he needs to be in order to win some. Yeah. So we've got this. In this thing called the gospel... I am appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher, depending upon what's needed in the moment. So that's why it's all tied back to this identity thing. It's not about our works. That's why he even says it right here. Not according to our works. We think, oh, that just means that we're saved not by our works. And actually, the context is not just according to our works for salvation, but your calling is not about your works. That's what he's saying. It's about our identity. So, when I know that I know that I'm a son of God, then that identity overtakes the environment, and then what the environment needs, Mark becomes. That's why when Jesus was, everywhere Jesus went, he had the floor. At one moment, 
he's a miracle worker. In the next moment, he's a teacher. In the next moment, he's a rebuker of the Pharisees. He's walking in his identity that creates the calling. The identity is the invitation walked in. I'm walking in my invitation. I'm fully functioning in it now. Now, that's not, that's not how it starts. I believe it starts specifically, but then as you grow and mature in your identity as a son or daughter, you can walk as a preacher, you can walk as an apostle, you can walk as a teacher. And it's all legit, and it's all the Lord. I think it's why he takes us through like he did in these seasons in my life. When it was prophecy, prophecy, prophecy. When it was teaching, teaching, teaching. When it was different, different things. And for me, I'll tell you how it worked for me. But uh, when I would, like I said, I said earlier, I could, you know, prophesy over anybody, anytime, anywhere in my sleep, and have all the details I needed, you know. And I depended on my gifts so much that he's, the Lord, like kicked all my crutches out from under me. And he took all that away because I depended on that gift more than what he wanted me to depend on, which was him. Okay. So when he took it all away, he took all my gifts away, literally for 20 months. And so I would have to stand up in front of thousands of people and still preach and still prophesy and take people out of the audience. And I had nothing, you know, it was like talking to these glasses. And he would just say, you know, pick that person out, and I'd have him stand up, and this is what the Lord says for you. And I had, up to that point, I had absolutely zero. And he'd just like, okay, you just need to learn to trust me. Just open your mouth, and I'll fill it. And I went, okay. Because I'm telling you, I had refined. I'd gone through that season where I could, I wasn't scared. I just prophesied, you know. And we, we, we used to do these exercises. We would, you know, just start prophesying and don't stop until I tell you to stop. Okay? And we would. We'd just keep right on going. As long as we, you know, just had our mouth moving, prophetic stuff would come out. And so we trusted on that, again, more than we had honed our gifts so much, we trusted it more than we trusted the Lord. Yeah. And we trusted our identity. Mm. And so he literally had to wipe all that out so I could trust him more, and then all the gifts come out. But they come out in a whole different form. They don't come out as a gift. They come out as Jesus. That's the way it's supposed to, a gift is supposed to come out. Yeah. When you truly manifest who you are, it doesn't come out, okay, now I'm going to be a teacher, and everything else quits, so now I'm going to be a prophet, now I'm going to be an apostle, like what he's saying. He was using that as an example to the different places he would function to somebody else to relate to him. But it's all supposed to come out very natural like we were talking about earlier. That's why the highest form of ministry is not your gift. We just like to get excited because we're operating in a specific gift. <laughs> Woohoo! I got a gift! I can now teach really well or I can prophesy or I can lay my hands on the sick and they'll recover and we think we've arrived. That's actually lower level. High level is when we operate in His Spirit. When we've submitted all of those gifts back to Him and then we give him ourself. I was talking to you about this the last time you were here, and I think it's so powerful still. Check now, when I take my teaching gift, when I take my pastoral, when I take the apostolic, and I just say, Lord, have them all. Just have them all. I, I don't want any of them anymore. I just want you. Now I transition from my gift to the person of the Lord. The Holy Spirit takes over, and now at any moment, he can give me any of the gifts. Because I'm not so focused, tunnel visioned on the one gift that I have. That's really the goal of the entire church. This whole thing in 1 Corinthians 12 and in Romans 12, it's just, it's to get the body functioning together, to get it operating. Hunter's got one gift, Courtney's got another, and when they work together, the fullness thereof. Eventually, the, the next higher place is to operate in the Spirit of God. There's a collective unity, Kendall, that we've been talking about, where it's now, it doesn't mean he's... It, he went through that season where he prophesied and prophesied and prophesied. I can promise you right now, if I said, Randy, could you please prophesy over every one of these people? Guess what he'd do? He would. That season doesn't end. But he has submitted that to the Lord. And now the, sub the spirit of the prophet, subject to the prophet. And now he can stand up and walk in any of those because it is no longer about his gift. It's no longer about my gift. 
I, mean, I think I've told you guys this before. I haven't prepared a sermon in over three years. And I just, I get a couple verses, maybe I got a few ideas, and I walk up to the pulpit, and I just, bam, it's the Lord now. And if He wants to start prophesying, that's what we're going to do. We're going to prophesy that Sunday. If we're going to teach or panel or whatever it is, I mean, none of us prepared for this tonight, other than we prepared us. That's what, if all you ever do is prepare your teaching, that's all you're going to ever do is teach. If all you ever do is prepare for whatever that specific task is, then the only thing that you're going to be good at is the task. Instead, submit yourself to the Lord. Submit your whole vessel to Him. And He takes it. And He uses it. And then at any moment, I can lay my hands on the sick and they'll recover. I can teach a message, whatever it might be. That's the highest goal we should all have. The specificity is good, but that's just training to learn how to walk in Him. That's the highest goal. That's when the body isn't that small, skinny little version of itself, but we begin growing to that full measure, Ephesians 4, that belongs to the stature of Christ. The head looks right on the body. <coughs> Amen? Mm -hmm. Yeah, not a big head, little body. Right. Yeah. If you just got, well, I'm a teacher over here, and I'm a prophet over here, that's skinny. <laughs> it's skinny. It's the fullness. I was just going to say, it kind of goes back to the whole, like, using the mundane life things to prepare yourself. And it's the whole difference between preparing, like, for a function versus your identity and growing up in who you are. Because even back to the guys that were in business that you asked advice from, they probably had life experiences that could have helped you, but they compartmentalized. He's ah, asking me about business, and so, therefore, I can only rely on my that's business good. experiences. And I don't have Excellent. anything unsuccessful there, you know, because we do that in so our So he had his businessman hat on. Right, and can he's only speak that from that instead of thinking about how has he prepared me to give advice. In this situation. Sure. That's right. yeah. Excellent. He was speaking from a function. Yeah, instead of an identity. That's right. Yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah. I kind of am thinking too. Maybe I was thinking out loud. Like, if I go into my classroom and all I have ready is my lesson, and a child needs this, but I'm like, no, I'm only focused on this. I can't see the needs of the others. So like if you go, if I go into the volleyball court and I'm like, here's our plan for practice, I don't care what anybody says, I don't care if you stink at hitting the ball, this is my plan, I can't see their needs and I can't go forward to help. I don't know if that makes sense. It does. Yeah. And that whole time you are totally equipped to help that specific need. But we're so tunnel visioned on our plan. Yep. Any other thoughts or questions? Has anybody never been prophesied over here before? Has never had a prophetic word? Huh? No, in general. Everyone's gotten some kind of prophetic word about what you might look like or who you might be? Everyone's got something they're hanging on? I've, I've only had somebody give me a general word about what I was going through, but never as far as my calling would go. Okay. You want to practice this a little bit? Of course. You, you want to be a guinea pig, Alicia? <laughs> oh, always. Always. <laughs> All right, come on over here. Get a, get a chair out for her. Yeah, I think I. Follow Joe. Lead him to the watering hole. <laughs> okay, so this is what we're gonna do. All of us are gonna participate in this, even people that speak Ukrainian. In fact, I want you guys to really take the lead in this. Okay. What we're gonna do. Because we're not going to regard her according to the flesh. Remember that? 2 Corinthians 5? We're going to regard her according to the Spirit. We're going to ask the Lord what He was thinking about when He made her. When He fashioned her, even before, where it says, I knew her. Before you were in your mother's room, I consecrated her and I appointed her. Thank you, Lord. 
So let's just popcorn this, which means you just pop up and say something and then land. Make sure you bring it in for a landing. Don't preach a message to it. Thank you. The Lord's telling me that he sees you as a powerful warrior and determined. I saw well, wings of an angel on you when you were born to fly. Did I hear a voice over here? Yeah, what you feel is weak is actually some of your greatest attributes. I don't know if you like to draw or are you drawing, but I saw you like <laughs> drawing. Um, especially as soon as you stand, I saw that you have to, like, not you have to, but you, it's your, like, what you want me to, to do is draw and Especially, uh, I saw a picture of sky and the ocean water. I just commissioned her to do a painting for us. <laughs> She's very gifted in that area. Thank you, Anna. Is that a confirmation? Yeah. Just a little? Yeah. <laughs> I saw how you, uh, you walk, you walk in um, behind Jesus. I mean, Jesus walking and... <laughs> yeah, you walking like following. Yeah, following. Yeah, and you was not satisfied. Then you go closer. You take his hand, and it's like become more closer. You know, you start walking with him. But still, something in your spirit you was not satisfied. And then you walk inside of him, and you walking in him. So and then you uh, see from perspective how Jesus see and feel how Jesus feel, you know, because he's he's the son, he is, you know, and you felt that like, and you felt the same like and you are a daughter daughter. Just what I felt about you, you are the daughter. Yeah, that's the scripture I got exactly what Mark is saying. It's the first chapter of Ephesians. Uh just as he chose us in him, she's in him, before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him in love. He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus to himself. And I saw the same process, just a little bit different context. You're in the process of, you know, that sonship from slave to son. And then from son to father, we talk about that, but that's literally going inside the Lord to see from his perspective. That's exactly what the Lord saw. The first thing I thought of Alicia was walking on water. And I, you know, tried to listen to the Lord a little bit about that. And it was kind of like uh, anytime you see the Lord or think you see the Lord or hear the Lord in very unusual setting uh, and if you just say Lord if that's really you bid me coming to you mm -hmm. you will just say come to me I got something similar to that I just saw you like bolting towards a cliff and then you just kept running and you just like just running to you <laughs> running on air <laughs> hey Anya when you saw her drawing was it just like a word of knowledge, or do you feel like the Lord was using that as a gift for him? Or what did you think about that? I saw like that you will see from a new perspective, you will see people from a new perspective. And if you will take, you know, this drawing or practice, I don't know, like God will show you from a new perspective about um, how to draw it, even, even it maybe will be something new for this world. I, I, I don't know how to explain it. Right. So the two words are actually connected, you're saying, because she yeah, saw them. I, I feel like it's like uh, what she's supposed to do. Like it's, I, I can't say that it's like the only thing that she's uh -huh. supposed to do, but it's much part of Okay. Your artist. I keep hearing the two words freedom and release, and as they've been um, sharing, as you as you walk in this new perspective and have this new vision, 
you'll have there will be a lot of freedom in that and you will be released from a place where you thought you were called things that you thought you were to do and released into things from this new perspective that you are really being called to do so it's almost a transition place but it's going to be from that new perspective that there are thoughts that you have strengths that you have but they're not necessarily your calling, but things that will build on and release you into kind of a freer place of, of where you're really supposed to operate. Is that through art or is that in general? I get the sense that it's much more creative on the front end, yeah. <laughs> but I don't know exactly, I didn't really get into that way, yeah. I've seen um, a mist or a fog, maybe it's a place that we come into at times and it's like we don't know kind of what's there but I think you have everything in you it's there and you might not see it for the fog or whatever but as you practice his presence and just trust and step out of that that the answer will be there and you'll see when Leslie was talking I saw something also and uh while she was moving her hands, I saw that her hands looked dirty. Your hands look dirty, but they're not. It was just something else. <laughs> they are a little dry, but it's not <laughs> <laughs> It's not my saw in the spirit. I'm just, just busting on you. But it was, it was like your hands were dirty, and it was for her. And then I asked the Lord what it was, and there's been uh, some things that you've done where you felt bad like you got your hands dirty, like you weren't supposed to be doing it. That's part of who you are. And the enemy's tried to torment you about that. And also, uh, it goes to, you're not afraid to get your hands dirty. And it's really a practical word in, in like two or three different arenas where you're supposed to be very hands-on, not just art, but that's how you not only create, but that's how you give life. That's how you minister to people through touch. And, and don't ever be afraid to use what God gave you. Because the enemy has really, I think, tormented you in a lot of these things. Like, don't do that. That's like unholy. Uh -huh. And all the stereotypic, you know, kind of junk that the enemy will play with you. Don't ever listen to it. Don't ever listen to it because he can't touch you. Okay. All right. The Lord just gave me the word vindicator, and I honestly don't even know what that word means without a dictionary in front of me. <laughs> so it must mean something to somebody or to you. He likes to do that. He likes to give words, and then I have to go look them up because I don't know. <laughs> he does that with me all That's the time. That's how we learn. <laughs> I'm looking up right now. Here's some idea. Isn't hey. the word vindicated? Doesn't it mean to be set free? Mm -hmm. If you've been vindicated of something, you've been set free of it. So if it's vindicator, it's setting other people's people like justice. Yeah, it's got to, to clear as from an accusation, um, to afford justification for justify, to uphold or justify by argument or evidence, to assert, maintain or defend, to claim gonna... for oneself or another. So, yeah, see, that is the Lord. Yeah. That is the Lord. You, you know, he says many times to me, and he says in the scripture, not to defend ourselves. Let the Lord take care of the justice for you. Okay, so one of her anointings is literally to release the Lord to take accusation off of people. Just by what we, you know, the things we've been talking about. Excellent. That is part of the nature of the Lord. You can literally take those accusations off people just by how you love them. Okay, that is a vindicator. Would you lay hands on her? Sure. Just pray for her? Absolutely. Okay. Tell me your name again. Alicia. Alicia. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we bless Alicia. God, I thank you. She's your child, God. I thank you that you're going to use her, God, mightily. In Jesus' name, Father, we bless her now, God. We bless her now, God. I 
don't know. I, I kind of actually sensed this right when I walked in. They were, they were um, people were already like speaking over you. But um, I hope this doesn't sound like um, bad or something. But it's um, not not knowledge, but like understanding and knowledge and education and thinking is not necessarily your strength. Is that is that am I wrong? Or um, or or is it easy for you? It's. I think that I'm. Um, I think that's very easy for me. It is easy for you. Okay, cool. That makes sense. I just felt like God said God's going to really going to uh, use um, use your mind and, and, and thinking and and that I, I thought it was a, a super supernatural thing that God's going to release, but I guess it is. It's already who you are. But I got to just pray for more of that. That um, literally she's going to be into um, just think and, and understand and and, and receive and um, just knowledge and revelation, God, like never before in Jesus' name. I have something, Mark. Yeah, go ahead, Lisa. I saw her heart laced in gold, and as I just see that it's um, part of the creativity, like as the way that your heart is laced, it's almost like His love. And as you as you create, it's like that gold is just gonna just come out and create a beautiful pictures, not just um, in art, but just mm -hmm. in people's lives. Mm -hmm. And um, and I see you as healed. I really do see you as healed, and um, and I feel that that healing, as you become more healed, that you are going to really just heal other others through your touch and your creativity. Bless that in you. I don't really know about the David about that because it, I mean I, I know you well enough, but I really don't know about that. When he made you, he didn't make you unwhole or unhealthy or you know what I mean. So his. Um, his inheritance or who you are, who you are, let's say who you are, who you are is whole, and his health, you know, so his picture of you isn't broken, and I think that goes a little bit further than your health, when he looks at you, he doesn't see you as this mess of nothingness, he sees you as this whole, radiant, beautiful, releasing love to the world, favorite daughter of his. So you have to see yourself, even if it's hard to believe that, you just have to look in the mirror and be like, mm -hmm. no, I am radiant. No. Oh, like you have to take that picture that he has of you and implement it as your picture. And I think to go with that, I kept thinking about color with you. And I thought about the day we went to get your painting supplies. And I just kept being impacted over and over and over again about how you picked the colors you picked. I mean, we must have picked a, maybe a handful of colors. And I kept thinking, how is she going to do this piece with all of these crazy colors? And it was just a handful of twos. And I kept thinking about this and kept thinking about this. And finally, the Lord said, you are moving color. And I kept thinking about how in the shack, how they described the spirit as like this wave of color. You can kind of see it, but you kind of can't. The Lord has invested in you how to express the characteristics of Him through creativity and through art. So you literally, you had such a trained eye and you like you picked a handful of tones. And you're like, well, I need, I need that tone. And I can get all these other colors with these two. Like, you needed a small, like, I would need a palette the size <laughs> of this room to do that. But the Lord has put in you a seed to release the colors of the spirit on us, things we would need, you don't need. It's in you. You just pour it out. I feel like with that, allow yourself to think like the artist that you are and not think like an intellect. Because mm -hmm. I think yeah. in thinking as an intellect, they're striving for you. And when you think with the creative <coughs> artist that's inside of you, that's, that's where the power comes. Mm -hmm. And that's where you walk without the striving. Yeah. It's a good word because too often I'm, I'm a perfectionist and then whenever I, like I, I was telling Julia, like whenever I just let go, <laughs> I'm like, okay, this is what's in me and I don't want to please anybody, you know? And that's mm -hmm. when the stuff that really turns out better. <laughs> yeah, and I was, oh. go ahead, Julia. I was just, I was just seeing that there might be a shift from your head to your heart. Mm -hmm. um, that God is saying, your heart is so strong, um, and I have made it strong, 
and I want you to stop carrying this weight in your head and pull it into your heart where I am. <coughs> and, the, and, it won't, and it won't be heavy anymore. And we will share that with you. Mm-hmm. And, he, and he's turning your face to the sun. I just see him turning your face into the sunshine and there being joy there. Because he made you to be joy. And I, and I see that, that there, your, your spirit is, is one of the most childlike spirits I've ever experienced. And that is so beautiful. God honors the childlike spirit. And part of the childlike spirit is joy. And so he wants to release that in you. He wants you to, he wants you to share your joy with all of us. And I'm eager to see that. I'm, I'm ready for your joy, Alicia. Uh, Alicia, I was just going to ask if I could. Do you feel like, and if you don't want to answer it, that's fine, but do you feel like you've had a lot of encouragement as, like, for your parents? Uh, we just want to, we just want to release encouragement to you. We just want to speak encouragement to you. We, we say nothing in a way to dishonor your parents, mm-hmm. but we just want to speak encouragement to you. And we just want to say you are amazing. And you are you are just awesome. And you are fearfully and wonderfully made. And you're absolutely adorable. And we just, you know, we just encourage your spirit. I feel like you need to know your heart is pure. As soon as Randy said about the dirty hands, I saw your heart with dirt and the dirt falling off and this bright white, just pure heart shining. And I saw your heart is big, like you're a little girl, but your heart took up like all of your body, <laughs> all of it. So the health you're seeking, Alicia, <laughs> starts inside, beyond the physical body. It's all about that in him. <laughs> Moving from following him, moving from holding his hand to walking in him. I think all of this gets, all of these words, these beautiful words, your big heart, the transition from head to heart, this creativity, this moving of colors, the in him status brings that all to pieces, all to bear, all starts to take shape. That's the only thing. If you ask me, out of all those words spoken tonight, that's your greatest journey is into the person of the Lord. All of this gets summed up in that. Don't try to fix anything. Don't try to change anything. Go after the person of the Lord. Alicia. I know it. I know. It. I just want to confirm that. Alicia, okay. you have a twin. Are you identical? Yeah. Oh yeah. Now, now, <laughs> Terribly. Now you have your own identity. Ooh. Low, laying it down, dropping it down, smack down. I ran into her twin one day, <laughs> and I called her Alicia, and she was very bold. <laughs> but but that after Mark once said what he did, and I kept thinking about your twin. That now you have your separate identity. Awesome. I've had trouble sometimes separating my one from her, and I think a lot of twins do have that issue. Do your, do your uh, mine are fraternal, so oh, okay. I don't have that so problem. I <laughs> a little bit. We, we want to bless your twin, Andrea. Yeah, yeah we just bless her to come Thank into her, her understanding of her. Yes. We speak blessing over her. Jesus. Amen. Love you, Alicia. Thank you guys so much. We want to Thank you. That was so, so helpful. <laughs> so helpful. Was this okay tonight, guys? Yeah. yeah. Was it helpful?